I'm going to talk about GWAS stuff, but I thought this would be more of a, uh, a research talk. So, talk about uh, uh, some of the work we do right now, because some of the coalescent theory stuff that I talked about in the first three lectures is really things that I haven't done anything on for almost 15 years. And uh, so now I want to tell you about a little bit of the work that goes on in my lab, but it ties into a lot of the other, other things, so we shall see how, how that works out. And uh, as before, some of this may be, you know, slightly, if it's sort of things you're not familiar with biologically, then you just have to interrupt, yeah? Okay. So, yes. Um, so we do a lot of work on, on Arabidopsis thaliana, which you heard of from Santiago as well. So in the lab, it looks like this. This is sort of the standard research organism. You, you, you saw a lot of pictures of these from Santiago's talk, and uh, it, it, it's a great research organism for, me, for many, many different reasons. But we've been more interested in, since I started in this, in looking at uh, what this plant looks like out in nature. And then you'll typically find a stressed little thing like this, right? Uh, and um, I guess one of my one of the things that my contributions to this field has been when I went into it to working with Arab Dops, is very few people were doing any kind of field work. So we've, we really tried to figure out what, what the plant is doing outside in, in various ways. And to begin with, where do you find it? Well, I'm going to show you some pictures here from, uh, from, from Sweden, um, where, where I'm originally from. Uh, that's not really only the reason I collected there. It also turns out that it's much less densely populated than the rest of Europe. So in Arabidopsis, in most of, most of Europe, it's a, it's a human commensal. It travels with plants, with, with humans. And, uh, uh, and uh, you always find it roadsides, you know, stone walls, anything, golf courses, parking lots, things like this, parts of uh, uh, edges of fields. But if you want to find a more natural population, you have to go somewhere where there's not so many, many people, and you can find that in Sweden. So for instance, here, here's a mountainside, and if you, if you climb up here, you find all along the edge here, there's Arabidopsis growing. And if you go up to the top, you have a nice view, you can have a picnic. Um, you can find it, and this happens to be a pasture that belongs to one of my uncles. You can find it out in meadows as well, right? Now you say this is not the natural habitat, and in a sense, it isn't, but of course, they've been grazing animals for a very long time. Pastures have existed at least since the Bronze Age, and there were probably bare areas before. And here you would find, you would find Arabidopsis on the edges of the stones, or on the mole hills, or on ant hills, anything like that, right? So this is a plant, um, it's a weedy plant, right? It is the world's worst competitor. It cannot compete with any other thing. It just, if you think about the Ophelis talk, this is a it survives on dispersal, right? It produces lots of seeds, they get there first, they flower, they set lots of seeds, and whatever bare areas there, in a few years, you know, grasses will grow over it, it has no chance to compete with anything else. It's, you know, it also grows in agricultural fields, but it's not really a pest, because it actually actually compete with any other, you know, even, even the most, most common domesticated plants easily outgrow it. Okay, and you can find it out on beaches. So here's another like nice location. Then you can even find it far out into the to the sand and things like that, where the wind keeps it up, right? Okay, um, the life cycle is actually quite interesting, and this is something I now put into every talk because uh, I want particularly molecular biologists to think about this. But it is interesting just as a general thing. So the um, in general, Arabidopsis is a the strain that people keep in the, the strain or the accession, so people use terms like ecotype accession strains, that's because Arabidopsis is naturally selfing, right? So you can take plants from out in the wild, they'll be inbred lines already, and you can just propagate them in, in, in the same way. Uh, so that particular strain happens to be rapid cycling. You can get nine generations per year. It'll just flower, set seed, flower, per seed. You can get yeah, up to nine generations if you're really fast, if you grow it in, in high daylight and so on. Most plants, if you collect them in the wild, will not do this. They will be winter annual, basically. They will, um, they will require cold to flower. And that's because they have this life cycle that the seeds come up. Basically, it escapes the drought of summer as a seed. Then in the fall, the seeds will germinate. You get little seedlings. Um, 
And they will have formed rosettes, like you see, this is October, there's already snow in, in one of our northern Swedish field sites here, right? Uh, and then these rosettes, you know, it's a bigger, nicer one here out on a beach, will overwinter underneath the cover of snow if they're far up north, but otherwise they'll just sit there in the, in the you know, horrible cold weather that is northern Europe, north of the Alps at least. And, and uh, then as in, the, in the spring, they will flower. So here, from, also from a field site, these are now potted plants here. You see uh, April, the snow is melting, and here are these plants that have been sitting, and look at this. This thing here, this is an etiolated, etiolated it's, a, it's, a, it's a flower bud. It's pale because it's never really seen the sun. That bud formed underneath the snow in the winter, right? And then just a few weeks later, boom, they just flower like this, right? So these are, these are incredibly rapid flowering plants that sort of adjust to, to, to the season. Okay, but now let's try to make this a little, think about what this actually means for, for the plant itself. We put out in our, in our field site temperature loggers underneath uh, the soil about one centimeter down. And this is the temperature during the life cycle of the plant. So remember I showed you the seedlings germinating and vegetative growth here. So in, in the lab when people grow these things, they grow them at 20 degrees constant temperature. Here in the wild, they're at about 10 degrees, right? And it oscillates almost 10 degrees day and night, right? And very quickly, it gets into periods where at least night temperatures are freezing. And it keeps oscillating like that until here in November, you guess what happens? Snow, right? A thick layer of snow is a, ther is a perfect thermal regulator, right? It keeps everything at basically zero degrees because that's the temperature of the frozen, frozen water. And, you know, this is perfect. That's right? so a four months with absolutely no temperature variation, right? It's frozen. But the plant isn't frozen and it's alive. And as you saw, they can even do things underneath, underneath that. Okay, and then here, uh, come out into um, April and the snow is melting. Now, this, this is for on these south-facing mountain slopes in, in, in the north. And look what happens. Four months, it's been four months of zero degrees, and now zero, zero, 30, zero, 30, zero, 30, zero, 30, every single day, right? I mean, if even at such northern latitudes, if you're sitting on, on a mountain slope that's like this and the sun hitting you, it gets pretty warm. I mean, I'm not, you know, exactly what temperature every cell of the plant experiences, I don't know. This could be these loggers, they're in plastic bags underneath the soil, you know, I'm not really a trained plant physiologist, but the main point here is that there are enormous temperature fluctuations. And if you just think about the biochemistry, like, you know, how do you make, for instance, a, a ribosome, a complex machinery of folded RNA and 200 proteins that all have to glob together. And if you work on microbes, you can, you know, these are often extremely exquisitely adapted to particular temperatures, right? You know, real plants undergo these fluctuations every day. So one of the research programs in my lab is, I mean, I'm, I'm, we're trying to test whether so plants are notorious for having a lot of gene duplication, you know, whole genome duplications, and then which results in what people refer to as genetic redundancy. So geneticists hate this, right? You knock out the gene and there's no phenotype because there are five other copies, you know, so you have to knock out every single one in the genome to finally see a phenotype. Now, these are very different, for, you know, these are often different from each other and people, you know, so the question is, what are they all doing? Um, I have a hypothesis that actually it, it could be like, you know, in your closet, right? You have clothes for different types of temperature. We see them if you grow the plants under very nice conditions, it's genetic redundancy, right? Because if you if you're in a, an air-conditioned airport and it's 15 degrees, it doesn't matter. You can wear winter boots or you can wear sandals, it doesn't matter. But if you go out in the snow, the sandals aren't going to be very good. And if you wear winter boots in this climate, you're not going to be very happy either, right? So maybe in the right climate, there actually is only one of these copies that actually work. And it, this is related to stuff I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so, um, so something I spent, and this is part of the reason I haven't done much about the theory. So for the last 15 years or so, uh, I was talking about the whole human GWAS effort to develop resources and so on. I, I basically jumped on the same bandwagon and realized that it, when you work on, on a plant that has inbred lines like this, it's obvious that you should just generate a collection of these. You should sequence them. And then you can do 
uh, what we heard about yesterday in Drosophila. But for Drosophila, Trudy McKay had to collect plants to make flies and make inbred lines. These are naturally inbred lines adapted to different habitats. If you can just sequence those, right, then you can basically uh, do genome-wide association for all kinds of traits involved in local adaptation and, and so on. So we spent a lot of time generating resources, uh, and uh, in 2016 there were two papers published um, with um, full sequences of 1135 accessions. So the genome size here is 120 megabases, it's about the same as in Drosophila, and we also have transcriptomes and, and methylomes of these. And I put a little asterisk on, on full sequences here because this is Illumina sequencing, right? So short read sequencing that you then sort of line onto a reference genome, and you can call SNPs and call polymorphisms very well this way. But there is at least, for every single line, there's like 15% of the reference genome not even represented, right? And this is completely symmetric. There's a lot of structural variation. A lot of it's involving transposable elements. We cannot capture this way. And this is a dirty secret in all this genome sequencing you will see. People will say we have sequenced so many genomes or whatever. Look carefully, you will see that actually there's a large chunk of it that they can't sequence because they can't actually. The only way to really do this, and that's what we're trying to do now, is to independently de novo sequence many of these genomes with uh, long read sequencing like PacBio or something like that, where you get large enough reads so you can independently assemble the whole genome. Yeah, you all know about genome assembly, you know, cut the genome into small pieces. And the problem is, right, with short reads, Things like transposons, which might be a few KB long, right? Unless you have reads that span each of these, there's no way you can actually assemble the genome. And this is, you know, it's completely missing. And this is a problem even in Arabidopsis, which only has 20% repetitive DNA or something like that, right? Most organisms out there are almost all repetitive DNA. If you look at the pine tree, it's almost all transposons and other repetitive stuff. And there's a few percent genes stuck in there somewhere. So this is a huge, huge problem. And actually, if you want to think about, so here's the interesting theory thing. Uh, if, if I were the devil, I would give everyone in evolutionary biology complete genomes today, like full sequences, just to see everyone crash and burn when they realized they had no idea what to do with the data. Because we're so used to analyzing SNPs and limited things. If you actually gave the things, uh, you can't analyze it until you can actually align it. And how do you align things when there are lots of structural variation? There are no good algorithms for this. I mean, this is not... This is not, I mean, the whole idea of doing SNP calling and stuff like that, I mean, in some level, and there's a lot of people have spent time on this, but this is really a technical challenge, right? We're doing a whole, if you, there will soon be machines that basically read off the entire genome in like megabase chunks at least, right? These are coming. So that's sort of a solved problem. We don't need any theory for that. We need engineering to make new machines. But once we have that, to actually compare them, right? Say that you have a machine that generates, you know, 120 million strings, you need to still put them together to analyze them. I mean, you can't do that without an evolutionary model because, you know, you have some idea of how these mutations and rearrangements happen. But that, okay, that's more of a philo philosophical point. Okay, so we have these accessions. We have genomes. We have seeds. These are all available in the stock center. There's a lot of phenotypes. We're trying to set up a database where all the phenotypes are in one place so that you can look at pleiotropy of, of, of uh, different mutations and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, as you look at the 1001 Genomes site, this is one site, but there are many, many different tools being put up. Okay, does this work? Well, uh, I showed you some early flowering time stuff in the last lecture where we showed, showed proof of principle that you can map things kind of with, with relatively small sample sizes. Now with big sample sizes, things work really well. This is just a comparison of what you see. Uh, the colored ones are, um, the black ones are, are the full sequences, and then you have the other, the other SNPs here, right? And basically, here's flowering time, for instance. Even if you correct the population structure, you pop up mutations in a whole bunch of known flowering time genes. Uh, depends on the temperature. It all works. This is all, this is all smooth. There's a, there's a lot of things being found. Uh, you can zoom in here, for instance. This is, we, we had developed a SNP chip, just like in human genetics. Uh, so here's 250,000 SNPs. And remember, in humans, they do GWAS with a million SNPs. But that's a much, much bigger genome with 250,000 SNPs. So it, our genome is 20 times smaller. So we actually have a much higher SNP density. Still, you can see the change here from looking at, this is a particular region in the previous things. This is, what, this is the associations you would have found with just the SNPs that we have in our chip. With the full sequence data, you get a completely different picture. You get an idea of how broad the region is. So 
uh, in the whole thing, we discovered 10 million SNPs, right? So for 120 megabase genome, right, that's a lot of polymorphism. Uh, of course, most of that is rare, so, but common SNPs, there's about 4 million. So we have an incredible market density. Okay, a little bit of uh, population history. We, so this is sort of more standard population analytics here. Uh, one interesting thing is, so now we took, if you take all these lines and you just compute the pairwise distances between them, so this is not going across the genome like with a uh, hidden marker model I showed you two days ago, whatever, uh, but rather just doing the average across the genome. What should we expect to see? I mean, what would you, what would you, what would you see if you did that on humans, for instance? What do you, if you just look at the pairwise differ, difference between uh, two human chromosomes? Well, you would have a, we said that once the polymorphism level is about one in a thousand, so the mean should be somewhere here, right? And it would differ a little bit depending on which comparison you did. There's a slightly more, there'd be more in Africans, for instance, right? There'd be slightly higher difference if you look at things from, from different populations. What you see here is a, it's a very strange trimodal distribution, right? You have a thing here, you have a thing here, and you have a thing here. Okay, this thing here is really weird. This you can only find in inbred lines. So, uh, because we're working on a selfer, actually, when I started working on Arabidopsis, a lot of people, a lot of population has told me I was a complete idiot because, you know, this is a selfer, it's a crap model organism. They're all going to be like, you know, working on bacteria, they're all going to be the same, and so on. Uh, this is not true at all. In fact, you find identical individuals only within, like, say, 500 meters, roughly. In general, there are some exceptions, I'll show that in a second, right? So these are members of inbred zip ships, they're self, right? So you have a, a mother plant, and around that plant you can then see uh, individuals are identical, right? So that's, there's your kin selection for you right there, if you think about dispersal distances. I mean, these are literally quite identical, right? Okay, then on the other end, we have a, a bunch of things here that are highly diverged. So let's look at what these are. Here is a map of uh, just Eurasia. We have samples in other places as well. And you can look at, um, so each dot here is a, is a sample accession. And the green lines connect things that are identical. Now I've excluded the ones that are sampled within 500 meters, right? There are lots of identical ones when it closes. And this is not surprising because that's a selfers work. But you do find some long distance stuff once in a while, right? So for instance, here is somewhere from, is that Bulgaria or Romania? I think it's Bulgaria. That is supposedly identical to something by the Ural Mountains. Here is something from England that's supposed to be identical to something in Russia and so on. Uh, most of those we're pretty sure are just contaminants. These are just people swapping seeds in the greenhouse. It's pretty easy to screw this up. There are two exceptions to that. As you can see in England, you actually do see a pattern right here. There's a lot of long distance identical things. So what does that mean? And uh, a clue to that is, I haven't shown it on the map here, but if you go to North America, you see a very, very different pattern. There, you actually have a clonal genotype that has spread over much of the Midwest, like a third of all the lines in the Midwest are completely identical. Precisely what people had told me when I started working on Aridopsis is what you would see in Aridopsis. Uh, why is that? Anyone have a guess? Why would you have such a different pattern in North America? Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, the came was spread with humans, right? It's, it's, not, it's an invasive, it, it's invaded with humans, and it probably, it wasn't there until people came. It spread with humans, and it probably ended up in like in a Monsanto seed batch or something like that, right? It's just, but uh, basically, um, it spread, and it took over the entire uh, Midwest, right? Do, do I think the migration rates are higher there? No. But the backfire migration rates are, right? The four, you know, I don't think they have a different dispersal probability there. I think they disperse like, like that in, in Europe as well. The difference is that if something disperses into a field where there's already a million plants, that has a much smaller impact when you're just invading a, a habitat. Then you basically end up looking like clonal growth, right? And I think that this could explain the, the pattern we see in England as well. I suspect that this increased pattern here has to do with England be, having been but the British Isles have been colonized after the last glaciation uh, relatively recently. There are lots of plants that, that, that did this, right? So who knows when it got across? But obviously much, much further ago. Otherwise, 
you know, we don't see anything like this. Okay, now, remember that was also, if you go back here to this thing, there were also these guys out here, right? So these are lines with the property that if you compare them to something else, there's a large pairwise distance. They're very diverse. Right? Remember, you're looking at pairs of individuals here. Sorry, this funny thing has to happen again. Okay, I have marked the lines that are involved in that thing in red here. And you can see that they are geographically clustered. And in fact, what we have is, if you look at this more closely, it turns out that if you do comparisons among these guys here in Spain, they are actually not any more diverged from anyone else than uh, the blue dots are, right? So these are part of a cluster. They're different, and there's another cluster. Here are things in the Cap Verde Islands I showed you before where we did the pink color stuff. There's um, things or they're diverged from these guys. There's another, appears to be, we have very few samples, but in Sicily there are some other lines that are diverged. Uh, from these, but not from each other. We find them in Lebanon. Uh, Angela Hancock has now, we also find some things in Africa, and Angela Hancock has gone and, and uh, looked at herbarium samples from uh, like Mount Kilimanjaro and high mountains in Africa, and it appears that these things are going on here. So what we think these are, are basically Neanderthals. These are Ice Age relics that were separated during the last glaciation, and, uh, you know, and now still exist, right? So, and you only find them on, on, on this, um, on, this uh, on the Mediterranean fringe here. In fact, we have come up with a model for what probably must have happened. So yeah, so a curious thing, so we get back here again. So in Spain, I was telling Santiago about this, an interesting thing is that these guys, depending, if you sample in Spain, right? If you, if you sample a blue one and a red one, you have quite a high divergence between them. A blue line here is actually more closely related to an Arabidopsis from Kazakhstan than it is from other Spanish ones, right? So you have an admixture zone between, between something here. So what we think happened is something like this, that during the glass glaciation, Arabidopsis was sort of pushed further down south. This was all ice, and there were like various refugia here, right? And Africa was greener, and Arabidopsis existed there too. Then when the weather uh, got warmer again, most of Africa becomes impossible and they retreat up mountains. This has happened, there's lots of, uh, lots of species have done this. And these refugia expanded north and we can actually see this. And then something weird happens to explain this pattern, that one of these things, and we try, based on uh, various analyses, it seems like it happened somewhere here, one of these clusters spread like this and basically pushed out all the other ones, right? So if you look at that map, does that remind you of something else you can think of? Some other spread that went the same way. This is, you know, this is a European history here, right? But, um, well, the spread of agriculture. Uh, the spread of agriculture into Europe took exactly the same route. It's also, it could also be the spread of Indo-European languages, right? But, so, you know, either it came with horses or it came with plows, who knows, right? But uh, I suspect that what's going on is that uh, basically, as humans started completely screwing up the environment, they basically, uh, and this is also whether, we just still don't know whether the plants that came with humans are particularly adapted to this. Some of them clearly are, like these things that are more rapid cycling, like the thing that's in uh, the, the common lab strain is pretty much only found in agricultural environments. It's just, you know, many weeds do this, right? It doesn't track the seasons anymore. It just produces, 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 right? Because presumably humans mess with the environment so much that it's too unpredictable to try to follow the seasons. A better strategy is just to maximize reproductive output. Uh, they could be adapted this way, but it could also just be a demographic effect, right? It could be one of these things because humans create so much habitat, uh, they just, it could just be like they end up in sort of in linkage equilibrium with humans, right? Uh, they have a higher, as again, this is, you know, the models you were presenting, right? Basically, they send out so many colonists that they basically swamp, swamp the natives. So you have, and actually, if you go into this, so then you get this admixture zone here in Spain, and actually, there's some suggestive evidence that if you look at the ones that look archaic, they're mostly found in these old oak forests that used to occur on the Iberian Peninsula before the Phoenicians and the Romans and everyone else chopped it all down to build things and burn things and so on. I mean, look around you here, you see the, see the same thing. And, and the, the ones that are more related to the ones in Kazakhstan are more found in, in agricultural habitats. Anyway, so that's a little bit of sort of biogeography of the species. Yeah. Uh, 
They do. They survive. Uh, they're, not, they're not the world's best, but there is a seed bank to be sure. Well, so what we see here, the reason we think this is going on, so this was a paper you know, by one of my postdocs. We do see some haplotypes up there that look like there. But so, so, you know, so the model would be like there's been this displacement, right? But here, this is more like, you know, this would be right? Whoops, suddenly. That, you know, there are Denisovan genes stuck, even though sort of uh, modern humans came in, right? You know, Han Chinese or whatever, and Tibetans uh, invaded. Um, uh, whereas here, they're actually living in Neanderthals uh, still among us, right? There's admixed ones as well. And actually, you can actually see, if you look at the pattern, that uh, the pattern of integration between these two looks very non-random. I mean, there are genes involved with flowering time and so on, that seems. So there have been some kind of selection uh, going on there. But no, I mean, there's no old seeds like you could actually... No, I, I, I think but our best bet is, I mean, they're actually living plants, right, that, in the south. In the north, I think you can find genetic remnants, but I think they've been hopelessly, hopelessly uh, uh, admixed. It's not, I mean, you know, this is a huge disadvantage of something like Arabidopsis, right? There is no fossil record here, right? None. I mean, this is a tiny plant. I mean, even, in, uh, people can do, like, uh, look at ancient pollen and things like that. There are analyses you can do, but, you know, I don't think <laughs> for Arabidopsis anyone has ever thought of doing this. Right, okay, so now I'm going to switch to epigenetics. So, uh, so this is so now I'm, so something that I've become fascinated about. So as part of doing all this, we also did methylome sequencing. Okay, and so I put this slide up here. So this is a slide that I just stole from a furniture store. Uh, this, this is a store that's selling light bulbs. They're epigenetic light bulbs, right? So this is, uh, I just put this up here to remind me. So uh, when people talk about epigenetics, uh, you know, there's this crazy stuff going on. There's entire fields uh, of ecology that argue that epigenetic is some kind of, the epigenetic Lamarckian mechanisms that make plants adapted to various things, right? There's absolutely no evidence for this. And anyway, the literature is extremely abstract and doesn't at all connect with the molecular mechanisms of what we know about. And there's also an idea that uh, epigenetics plays an enormous role in development and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, the evidence, there's one of those fields where people talk a lot and there's very, you know, there's much craziness going on. So to be more specific, what I'm going to talk about is DNA methylation, DNA cytosine methylation. So basically on C's, cytosines, right, can be modified, methyl group can be added. Uh, in, uh, in humans, you find methylation in this sequence contents. You have C and G, right? And then basically you can have a C, and it's symmetric, right? The two strands, both of them can be methylated. And the cute thing about this, and this is, so this is a known, uh, it's associated, you can tell, you can, if you, if you methyl profile humans, you can tell whether they're smokers or not. It's a, there are markers for cancer, there, it's correlated with lots of things, but we know very little about what the mechanism uh, is involving methylation. What, what makes it very interesting, right, is that these, in this context here, right, when DNA is replicated, you get two hemimethylated strands, you then synthesize a new strand, then you can imagine an enzyme that goes along and just puts the methylation back on again, so you basically have a cell memory, right? So you can imagine that this actually works, and like Maynard Smith wrote papers about it, this actually works like a fifth base that you can switch on and off and that can be inherited, and you, you know, it all makes sense that this could be involved somehow in some kind of Lamarckian inheritance, for instance, right? But of course, not all methylation is like that. In, in plants, you also have methylation in this context. Uh, H here stands for anything but a G, right? So distinguish it from that. You can, this, this is also symmetric. It could be, and it can be inherited, but it involves a feedback loop uh, via hist with histone modifications, right? But you also find methylation just as sporadic Cs everywhere. This has to do with uh, gene silencing, uh, this RNAi mechanisms that Santiago talked about, so on. It, uh, it leads to methylation of DNA. This can, of course, not be inherited at all, because when you reproduce DNA, right, you get one strand that just loses it, right? So, okay, so there is... So why do people care about this? Well, you know, there are these associations. The idea of, of um, 
things being in, inherited across generations that are kind of changed by the environment is, is fascinating. And, you know, but as usual in biology, it really comes down to the fact that it's easy to assay because you can, you can treat DNA and then basically sequence and see whether a base has been methylated or not, right? So this is just like sequencing, but we treat the DNA so that uh, you know whether the site was, was methylated or not. And that's what, that's what we've done to learn, learn something about this. But we approach it in a very sort of... Um, yeah, assumption-free way, right? So for, just ask, so it's, I did it, I, uh, I thought, well, okay, we'll see, maybe it's correlated with flowering, maybe it does something like this, right? We had no idea what to do, but, you know, we just, it was a fishing trip, we generated lots of data. Okay, first you can see that these types of methylation are very different. So here, for instance, and this is a plot from a 2015 paper, if you just take all of the lines here, each dot is one of our lines, and we grew them in two different temperatures, and we just look at genome-wide methylation. So this CG methylation doesn't appear to change very much, this kind of methylation not, but this methylation uh, does. And so just showing, you know, this right away tells you that this cannot be uh, a... This type of methylation, it clearly behaves like a phenotype here, right? You grow them in different temperatures and the methylation level changes. And this is actually not, this is not surprising at all. We know that these RNA-directed DNA methylation mechanisms that are involved in silencing various things um, respond to temperature. Okay, so yeah, so another interesting thing is, and I have people in the lab trying to model this again, if you look at methylation on a particular site, for, for sites, for CG sites, they tend to a particular site tend to be either not methylated, right? So this is distribution, uh, or they tend to be very, very highly methylated, almost completely, right? So that would make sense for something that is actually has been inherited, right? I mean, it's, if you look at the SNP, you either have it or you don't, right? But the other types of methylation don't behave like this at all, right? So instantly you can see that this cannot possibly be something that is epigenetically inherited, because if it is, right? then you either have it or you don't, right? You inherited it or you didn't. This should be sort of Mendelian segregation. But this kind probably does. So that's an interesting thing. So it's very interesting to try to, to do population genetics and model this, right? Because you have some sites here that behave like phenotypes. Some of them look like they behave like genotypes or epigenotypes, uh, rather. Uh, a bit more background, actually. So I didn't... So what does this stuff do? I said that we don't know. And this is true. People generally don't know what it's doing. It's clear. If you look at the plant genome, where you actually find it is mostly you find methylation on repetitive DNA. If you look at the human genome, most of the seeds are actually methylated, except regions that are free of it. There are these CPG islands that are involved in gene regulation somehow, right? In plants, it's clearly associated. In, you, plants, you, in, in plants, you find it mostly in repetitive DNA. Uh, another important thing is that if you knock out DNA methylation completely in Arabidopsis, the plant lives. It can't be that important, right? You know, it's, it, which is, if you do that in, in an animal, uh, in a higher animal, they die. It's completely lethal, right? It, and there are probably, and for many plants, they also die. They tend to be plants with a lot more transposable elements. There's a pretty strong idea here. So I said Arabidopsis is fine. Yes, you can knock it out. But after a few generations of propagation, they start looking really funny. And, and transposable elements start coming alive and the genome starts not behaving well. So somehow it has to do with marking, marking where heterochromatin and where, uh, where uh, uh, transposable element, elements are in, in the genome. Yes. Nope, just one line, just one line. Nope, it's a particular site. What is the methylation level of that site? It's the average across the fact that we're sequencing a, se we're sequencing a leaf, for instance, right? The leaf has millions and millions of cells. So what we're actually looking at here is the distribution of cells. Because, of course, methylation is an on or off thing, right? And that's indeed what this looks like, right? But, of course, we don't sequence single cells yet. This is starting to happen, and this is going to revolutionize lots of things, that you can start looking at single cells. But normally what we do, we squish up like a little seed leaf. So what you're looking at here is actually the distribution. So the right way to interpret this, I think, is that 
Uh, this is the distribution of CAG methylation over the cells in the tissue that we sequenced. And of course, of course, methylation is a binary thing, right? And but what I'm, what I'm saying here is that in the tissue, it is clearly not, right? So in some sense, these types of methylation must be phenotypes, because if they actually had been passed along as genotypes, they should not show this kind of pattern, right? Okay. Right, so, so, one of the, so we had this data set we didn't know what to do with. Um, a very good postdoc, Manu Duvan, figured out, you know, had read up in the literature on this and decided, well, okay, let's first, to make some headway, you had like sporadic patterns across the genome with different levels. What do you even do with this, right? SNP data, we know a little bit how to analyze. We know what is coding, what isn't. We know what it does. Here is something you don't even know what it does. You don't know whether it's a genotype or a phenotype. So we started by dividing it into uh, so-called gene body methylation. So this is something that's seen in, in mammals as well. Basically, in in long genes, especially housekeeping genes, you find CG methylation inside the gene itself. Uh, genes that have that, it's, it's evolutionary concerned over long distances, right? The, the genes that have that tend to have it everywhere. The specific sites are not. Uh, and function is uh, totally unknown. Basically, it's correlated, positively correlated with transcription across lots of... Uh, of course, lots of cells, but nobody knows whether that's a cause or effect or both, right? It could also be some kind of uh, feedbacky loop. Okay, and the other type is what you think of as transposable element like. So, um, on transposable elements, you tend to find methylation in all contexts quite heavy. And this is associated with known silencing pathways, that this RNA-directed DNA methylation is basically a small RNA that targets a region that somehow leads to enzymes going on there, putting on methylation, which probably is a guide for histones changing, which leads to the chromatin being compacted to silence transcription, something like this, right? Uh, there is something known about these pathways, and this is generally depressive, repressive, right? You can look at this. So here's a plot of across... We look at, in, since we did this in many lines, you can look at the expression in lines, so you can calculate the correlation coefficient per position uh, between expression and the methylation level, right? So we calculate the correlation coefficient across all the lines, and then we average that across all the genes, and you see a pattern that basically, uh, if here is the transcription start site, uh, inside the gene body there's a positive correlation between transcription, uh, tends to be a positive correlation, right? Whereas for this other kind, it tends to be negative, right? Okay. Does it matter? Well, you can ask this question too. So lots of money is now being spent on doing this kind of epigenetic, epigenome profiling. So we can ask the question, since we have transcription data and we have methylation data, we can ask the question, uh, given that we have all the SNPs, does knowing the epigenome help us explain transcription across the gene? Right? So that we have 17,000 transcription values, so that's like 17,000 quantitative traits. Uh, okay, so now we're going back to GWAS again. So what we're doing here is these are the one, two, three, four, five chromosomes. And here are all the genes on, on the same five chromosomes. And the SNPs here are basically looking at, uh, you put a red dot whenever there is a significant correlation between a SNP and uh, uh, transcription. Yeah. So you get a long band here because of cis regulation, right? So these are SNPs inside the genes themselves that are correlated strongly with transcription levels. Um, and uh, the other stuff would be transacting things, right? If there was some major transcription factor, you know, something that regulated lots of genes, you would expect to find a band going this way, right? Yes? That would be uh, some variant that affected lots and lots of genes. We don't really see that. If you have a band going this way, you should believe that you have an artifact, because that would be like something that is correlated with SNPs everywhere. And uh, I think in this case, it mostly has to do with genes that have funny transcription values that tends to throw up lots of false positives when you do the, do the analysis. OK. Now, we do the same thing, but instead of looking at SNPs on this axis, we're looking at methylation variants. So you're looking at the methylation variation that is correlated with transcription across the whole genome. All right, For, you see the same thing. There's lots of cis-regulatory stuff here. And uh, 
Right. So the blue is, is gene body methylation. The orange is uh, TE-like methylation. That doesn't matter so much. Okay. But what's cute here, so you can see there's many fewer dots. So clearly there's many, the correlations between transcription and methylation are much, much weaker, despite the notion that methylation should be a major regulatory thing, right? It doesn't seem to be so strong. But we found, some, so here, we found one of these things I was telling you about here. Here is something that acts in trans. And this turns out to be one of these argonaut proteins. So this is really cute, right? So they're like, whoa, I wouldn't really have dared to believe if it hadn't been in this gene, right? So this actually appears to be a true epi allele. I mean, there was nothing in the SNPs that did this, right? So methylation on this gene is correlated with transcription on genes at lots and lots of places throughout the genome, right? But there is no SNP correlated with this. So this is probably not a genetic variant, but actually an epigenetic variant of this allele that has some effect. So that's very cute, but we don't find very many of these. And you can see that from this plot, where we're looking at, take all the genes and look at the distribution of SNP, the top SNP inside the gene that is associated with transcription in, in, in cis, right? And you see here, so we have a cutoff of 10 to the minus 8 or whatever, and in this particular analysis, there's 965 plus 114 SNPs that show that property, or genes that have, the, you know, that have a significant SNP associated with them. Yeah? You see that? On this axis, we do the same thing for methylation. You ask how many genes have local methylation associated with their transcription, and then there are 63 plus 114 that are above the cutoff on this line. So there are many, many more genes that have significant SNP variation uh, explaining their transcription. Furthermore, of the ones uh, that have high methylation variation, almost all of them also have uh, SNP variation. There are only 63 genes here for which we find significant methylation correlated with expression and, not, and no SNP that can explain it. So, you know, so these may actually be candidates for true epigenetic variants, right? Where there's just this methylation variation that is doing it. And this can happen, right? But, whether, and, but you can try to quantify how important that is. And the conclusion you get is that it doesn't seem to be very important. So here we do one of these variance component analysis again, right? We take each gene as a phenotype and we partition the variance into this background kinship. So how much does the genetic background, all the other SNPs in the genome explain, and that's the green. We partition it into cis-acting SNPs, so SNPs that are close by. How much of the variation in transcription do those explain? And cis-acting methylation effects, right? So you fit one of these models where transcription level depends on genome-wide background, local SNPs, and local uh, methylation. And then you basically bin all the things by how much of the total proportion of the variation you explain. Uh, and here's the distribution of all the genes falls. So for most of them, we don't explain very much. Transcription is extremely noisy. Most of it falls into environmental noise. But what you, the conclusion here is, of course, that basically there's a trade-off between is it other genes regulating it or is it local SNP variation? But the methylation variation contributes extremely little to, to gene regulatory variation. This was 10 degrees, uh, 10 degrees uh, constant temperature. Don't know. We haven't done that. We don't know. Uh, we have some data on that. I think it was pretty similar in 16 degrees. Uh, you know, these are quite old. So we are, we are redoing these experiments now. Unfortunately, you know, sequencing genomes is getting cheaper and cheaper, but doing like RNA sequencing for, for large numbers of lines is still actually pretty expensive. So, uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We don't, we don't really know that, right? Could, could, could possibly be. I, I absolutely agree. So this is just a crude first look, first look at it, right? I mean, and it's also been stacked against methylation, right? Because one of the, because basically there's so much genetic variation that it kind of just tends to, to explain everything. Like one of, so one of the things that you learn, most of this, And I don't have a figure showing this, but if you take just the methylation variation and build a tree clustering all the accessions, you get exactly the same tree as if you do with the SNPs, right? Which basically shows that either the presence or absence is so strongly cis-regulated by the SNP variation, or the inheritance of uh, the epigenetic variance is so 
faithful, that it actually doesn't matter, right? And this, of course, means that it's very important, impossible to disentangle these from, from, from each other because they're so in such strong uh, linkages equilibrium. Okay, so that was that. Okay, but so then we did something else, and this is where it started getting a little bit more surprising. So, well, the other stuff was, of course, surprising too, but now we started looking at, so remember I said that uh, this kind of methylation pretty much had to be a phenotype. So let's look at it as a phenotype. Just do GWAS on that. Now we have SNPs on this axis, and we have differentially methylated regions on this axis. And again, you get a band like this, and the big clumps here correspond to the centromeres, where there's many more transposons, which means there's much more of this kind of variation. But here we found like our first real surprise, that basically a clear, very strong transregulator, which corresponded to one of the main genes known to be in, in, involved in this. So there's major allelic variation for, uh, and this explains, I, I don't have the numbers, this explains quite a lot of the variation. Okay, and here you can see what the actual G was if you plot it the way I plotted it before, right? There's a massive peak here. And just to be completely sure, we even did a cross. And you know, here you can see this illustrates what I was talking about before, uh, how much wider this peak is, and, and it is extremely high. Okay, so one interesting speculation is that this might be a temperature adaptation. I'll show all these things. Up. So we've seen before that this kind of methylation is temperature sensitive. Uh, now we find major allelic variation that explains this. I'm, I'm just a complete speculation here, right? But the reason I started believing this is that uh, there was a paper by Arjan Kalkborg's group in, in Sweden who looked at SNPs throughout uh, the global distribution and, and did one of these correlations with climate variables, right? He was trying to look for signs of selection. And uh, SNPs in this gene show up as being extremely strongly correlated with temperature variability across the genome, right? So somehow this suggests that there is something like that um, going on. Okay, so then we did something else. So, um, so, this, so we know that that kind of methylation was associated with temperature. We started looking at the gene body methylation. Now, CG methylation does not respond to temperature at all, right? It's extremely stable, as far as we can tell. But we found something else that was weird. Uh, so this was only looking in our, 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 our Swedish sample. We found that there was a, a correlation between latitude here. I mean, basically, we plotted it here as, as the minimum temperature where they, where they came from. The lines from the north have higher levels of gene body methylation than from the south. It could be that there is a, a sort of a, a climb there. Um, and they also show a different gene expression on average across all, all these different genes. So in general, genes that have gene body methylation have higher expression levels than the ones that do not. This is because they're housekeeping genes that tend to be on a lot more. And there is a slight difference between the ones in the north seem to have a significant, it's tiny, but a uh, significantly higher difference in, in, uh, in methylation. And uh, we were just like, grasping for these, why, why could this be, right? But perhaps it has something to do with just getting genes expressed under lower temperatures. Perhaps you need to do something with the chromatin to make it more open or something like this. Uh, if you do a GWAS on it, we don't, same thing as before. There's a lot more of this transacting stuff here. There's no single strong cis-acting effect. There is some band of things going on here that we don't know what it is. Um, if you look at, if you take out some of these things that seem to be associated with many things, if you do a cross, some of them are real. Basically, here's a LOD score from, a, from a, an F2 cross, and the blue bands correspond to uh, transacting effects on, on, on methylation, and there's some overlap there. Okay, could selection be responsible for this? Well, the, the weird thing is you have a strong geographic pattern, right? So non-reference alleles, this is kind of weird. Uh, uh, why would it be the non-reference allele? I'll get to that in, in a second. Are found in the north only and they're associated with increased methylation. Uh, well, actually, I'll say that right away. So the reference genome is, is a much more southern accession, right? So basically, you're just picking out SNPs that are associated with being in the north, they're associated with higher methylation. They're highly increased in regions that look like they've undergone some kind of selective sweep. They're highly increased in, in regions uh, that are near SNPs that in these kind of global surveys are associated with temperature. And there is an over-representation uh, representation of certain uh, gene ontology categories. 
So all suggesting that there's something weird going on, but I'm just completely speculating here, right? Yes. Yes, but badly. We, we try to control for it, but I don't believe it. So this is one of those examples where, um, you know, we said all these things in the paper, but, you know, there's a big caveat, don't shoot me if I'm wrong, right? Because, uh, yes, we try to control for this fact that there is population structure leading to this, but I don't actually believe that any, any of these correction methods really work. Yes, well, but, but this is not an environmentally induced thing. So, I mean, there, this, is, uh, this is just... These are all grown in the same temperature as 20 degrees. I was just plotting as a function of temperature. So, it's, so what's happening here, right, is that, sorry, I should have been clear. So, so when it comes to the CG methylation, which seems to be strongly heritable, it actually appears that the plants retain an epigenetic memory of where they came from. It's more generations, but it hasn't changed, right? This stuff is so stable, right? And I'll, I'll get to that in a second, what could be causing this, right? So we had two weird things here. We found geographic patterns in, in methylation, and we found like this one major gene that seemed to explain a lot. So then we, I got involved with this. Um, we finally got the 1001 met methylones, right? I, the, the stuff I showed you before was only the subset of Swedish ones. I think I forgot to say that, sorry. Uh, just looking at, at lines in Sweden, this is why we only have two, two dots like this. So we got... Uh, a couple of years ago then, we had finally the, the full set done for the whole, you know, global collection. And then we could basically see, are we going to see the same thing? Okay. And the answer was yes, but it's much more complicated. Uh, so here, for instance, here's a map of uh, gene body methylation. And what you see is that there, so I showed you before that there was a, more gene body methylation in northern Sweden than in the south, right? This is what I was showing you. But then, is there some kind of geographic line? Nah, not really, but there are very, very strong geographic patterns. I have absolutely no idea what's causing these patterns, right? Uh, and this is one of the things we're trying to figure out. I mean, it clearly does not look like this is you know, directly correlated with climate or anything like this. If anything, I suspect that this could be, it could be that these are methylation changes that are induced by some kind of pathogen that may be sensitive to something about it. You know, we have no idea what's, what's, what's going on here. And this is one of, one of the things we're trying to figure out now. But it, but it gets weirder, so hold on. Uh, so, yeah, there is correlations. And, you know, you can plot it. And I, I don't know if I have, let's see if I have that plot in there. Uh, yeah, forget about it for a second. Okay, so hold that thought. You, you can sort of, you can get significant correlations in any way you do, do it, but it's so difficult to correct for the population structure here. Furthermore, I'm extremely worried that there are batch effects in how, how this methylation profiling was done over a thousand different lines because it was done by different labs at different times by different postdocs and technicians and so on. Uh, but that there is a pattern is pretty clear, and I don't think it's, it's random. The other thing that is very interesting is this. Uh, I, when we analyzed data before, I told you we, we looked at gene body methylation and we look at transposable element-like methylation. Turns out, when you look more carefully, that is not a clean distinction at all. So here's like a cartoon gene, right? Um, with some exons and introns and so on. Uh, and it's not just the case that you find gene body methylation or transportable element like methylation. Most genes, in fact, have the property that in some accession there is no methylation at all. In other accessions, you have something that looks like gene body methylation. There is CG methylation sort of scattered throughout. And then in some accessions, you find what looks like transposable element like methylation. You have heavy methylation in all contexts. I don't know why that is. It could be that there are cryptic TE insertions that lead to this kind of stuff. Another possibility, uh, which I think is the one I favor, is that this gene silencing machinery that sometimes silences, that is meant to silence transposable elements also have a tendency to silence genes. And you can imagine, for instance, that some of this pattern here, the gene body methylation pattern, could arise because the gene gets silenced and, T, uh, and uh, methylation gets put on everywhere. These kinds of methylation depends on small RNAs sitting there to maintain it, right? If that stimulus goes away, maybe this stuff just stays behind because it's, it can actually be 
passively propagated from generation to generation. Whether that then has a function or not is completely unclear. Whether the, um, okay, but any okay, yes. Oh, yeah, there's a very complicated slide. We take all the lines and you're basically looking at the correlation uh, patterns between uh, various environmental variables and you cluster them by sort of similarity in the correlations across across all the accessions. This is one of these bi-clustering things, right? I just put that up here to show you that basically you get correlations with anything under the sun. None of these things are independent from each other. We don't know how to correct the population structure properly. Uh, correlate, don't know what they mean. But we're working on trying to figure this out by in, in field trials and, and, and see what happens. Okay. Um, on the other axis, this is actually a little bit more interesting. Here we take the different types of methylation. You take all the CHH methylation, and you look at the correlations between lines this way, and you cluster the different types of methylation by similarity in these correlation profiles. And then what you see is that all the CHH methylation, where, whether, okay, so there's no, I forgot to tell you one more thing here. Because we work in an experimental organism like Arabidopsis, we actually know which bits of the genome, mostly transposable elements, are affected by the RDDM pathway. And we know that because we can, somebody has already knocked it out, done by sulfide sequencing. You can download from the line the methylation profile of genomes with like uh, 70, 80 genes you know, being knocked out one of the other, so we know which pathway affects what. So you can classify methylation types by whether they're affected by this pathway or by this pathway. You can look at all of them together. Point here, all the CHH methylation goes together, all the CHG methylation goes together. But if you look at the CG methylation, it actually splits into two types. The, the thing, the CG methylation on a transposable element tends to cluster with CHH methylation, whereas the gene body methylation tends to cluster with this type of methylation. And that's very interesting because there was uh, a paper uh, uh, also in 2016 uh, by Bob Schmitz who went, looked through all the brassicaceae, sequenced them to see if you, just to see what the variation would be. And he found two species that don't have gene body methylation. Uh, those also tend out to miss a gene that is responsible for this kind of methylation, suggesting that there's some kind of causal feedback between, between, these, between these pathways. Okay, right, so I'm, gonna, I'm getting towards the end here. Now, where it got really interesting to me is now doing GWAS and all these things. Because what we found is just kind of, I showed you before this, that we found a peak in this gene CMT2, and it primarily affects transposable elements that are actually targeted by CMT2. So that all makes sense, right? But then we look at transposable elements uh, that are targeted by the RDDM pathway. And now suddenly we found three more peaks here, and this is two more of these argonaut proteins which are involved with small RNA processing, and a subunit of polymerase 5, which is also involved in, 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 in these pathways. None of these are annotated as directly doing this, but you can see that it all makes sense, right? For gene body methylation, there's nothing shown here, but actually find something in one of the main methyl transferases that puts things together. Uh, don't worry about thing. Uh, what I want to say is basically these are incredibly clean GWAS results. We found extremely strong candidates. Uh, we have like a dozen different genes identified, and there's an enormous overrepresentation of very strong candidates, right? So this is really weird. This is not what you usually see. Usually you get obscure results that you don't know what to do with. Here you find genes that you kind of know are involved. There are major alleles of big effect, right? So there are only two possible explanations. One of them is uh, maybe this stuff is just completely neutral variation. It doesn't matter. So you just have a bunch of common alleles and big figs drifting around. Okay, I haven't ruled that out completely. I rather suspect that there is selection maintaining this stuff, right? That you're actually looking at some kind of, you know, these big effects is what you typically see when there is some kind of balancing selection maintaining things. I suspect that what we're actually looking at here with all this methylation stuff is a, gen a genomic in immune system that is trying to, well, it does some of the stuff that Santiago looked all the way. So the pathways we're talking about here are involved in defense against viruses and defense against transposable elements. And it makes sense that this is highly variable. Now, why it also shows geographic variation, I have no idea. But that's uh, part of what we're trying to figure out. I have a few more details here. And it's really cool to look at this stuff from a... We talked about, so in Arabidopsis, 
you typically, I said before, it can be hard to identify which gene you're looking at. Not so here, because, because the phenotypes are so specific. So for instance, um, if you look at, so this plot shows the overlap in the, this is a, a Venn diagram showing these are all the transposable elements uh, which are affected in the genome when you knock out this gene CMT2. These are the regions of the genomes, which are almost all transposable elements, that are affected by the natural variation in this gene. And you see the overlap here is extreme, right? Uh, if you, it's like almost you know, close to 60% overlap in phenotypes. So basically, even though there are many genes under one of these association peaks, you know that you're looking at exactly the right phenotype because you just look, there's such a specific trait that it's clear what's, what's going on. Okay, in this case, it seems like it's doing the same thing, but it can also get interesting. So here, I showed you that we had an association in a subunit of uh, RNA polymerase alpha, uh, RNA polymerase 5. And uh, if you knock that gene out, it has broad spectrum effects on, on all kinds of transposable elements across the genome, right? There are lots of them. The natural variation just affects a subset, right? And that's interesting, like why there's that subset? It could be that there's just less power. That's the first obvious one. I got that question a lot. That's not what's going on. It, in fact, looks like it's, uh, they're targeting specific classes of transposable elements. So um, here, for instance, I, uh, if you look at what is being targeted by natural variation in CMT2 and this POL5, Pol, Pol5 subunit, it's the numbers, in the Arabidopsis genome as a whole, if you look at the distribution of transposable elements, it's about 40% are these helitrons, which are weird elements that replicate via a rolling circle mechanisms. The DNA elements that seem to be involved in moving genes around. They're associated with recombination hotspots and other things. Uh, then you have LTR gypsies. Uh, so these are basically the genomic version of the retroviruses that Santiago talked about. You have all the kinds of various DNA elements and, and so on and so forth. CMT2, this allelic variation here, is only affecting these guys. That's what the, these guys are involved in. Um, and uh, if you look at this POL5, it's like massively targeting these guys. And in fact, the natural alleles have much higher specificity, right, than, than the knockouts. So if you look at CMT2, again, this is the distribution of different TE classes in the genome. If you look at the mutant, the mutant mostly affects these guys, and uh, I showed you this before, there was complete overlap, right? And if you look at the natural allelic variation, it affects the same class. Um, okay, so, but this phenomenon is extreme here. If you look at Pol5, if you knock out this gene, it basically affects transposable elements across the whole genome. They're like broad spectrum effects. But the natural allelic variation only affects uh, these helitrons, right? So this suggests that Whatever this natural variation is doing, it can give you some insight into what the specificity of these things are. We know very little of these pathways actually, actually work. So even if you're, so I'm interested in the evolution of all this stuff, right? But if you just want to find out the function of this, a very cool thing here, I think, is that you actually have allelic variation to, to work with DNA methylation. So why is this important? Well, so I said from the beginning that in, so I mean, why do we know so little about DNA methylation? Uh, why haven't all these molecular biologists figured this out? Well, because it's very hard to work with. We don't have any way of manipulating it, right? There is no way you can't synthesize DNA methylation. People are working on this too, but it's very hard, right? And in most, you can't do the standard molecular biology trick of just knocking out the gene and see what the phenotype is, because if you do it, except in Arabidopsis, right? But in most higher organisms, the organism just dies, right? So that's not good. You can't really do any genetics on it. But what we have here, and I think this is going to be true in lots of other organisms, you're showing there's actually a lot of allelic variation. So now we can actually do genetics and actually see what, what, what's going on. But that's a side thing. From my point of view, yeah, so to sum this up here. So what, what we have found is that the methylation pattern seemed to reflect the temperature of origin. We haven't done much experiments to look at the response to the environment yet, but it appears that somehow plants remember their past environments through a mechanism that could be epigenetic, right? However, and, and given that uh, you, this kind of methylation actually can be inherited, that's actually entirely plausible. Now, why this would be the case, whether this is in any way adaptive, we have no idea, right? 
It could just be a side effect of having grown in a certain environment, right? Um, but epigenetics aside, there is also a very strong uh, genetic basis, suggesting that some of this could simply be like a genetic adaptation that gives rise, gives rise to this. And why, but what, you know, why is the pattern correlated with environment? Why do we have such an unusual genetic architecture? And both of these things suggest selection, but we have no idea what the phenotype is. So <laughs> this is one of the things that we're trying to do in the lab now, right? We, you know, we're making crosses between all these things. We want to monitor over time how the epigenome changes. We want to monitor what happens to chromatin. We want to monitor transposable elements. We're doing field experiments, growing these things while to actually see to, to see what is happening, right? Because so I, I, I um, and the, my working hypothesis is that somehow what we are looking at is a, a relatively poorly understood uh, you know, genomic immune system that is involved with keeping transposable elements and, and, and viruses under, under control. And I think it's kind of important to figure out uh, what it is. And I think using um, sort of population data can actually help us do this. And I think that was all I was going to say. So how am I doing my time? Oh, not too bad. All right. So I'm a little bit early, but that's OK. So uh, any questions? I realize this went a lot fa pretty fast here with lots of different things. But um, so this is a huge project, of course. Anyway, yes. So OK, so experimental evolution in, in Arabidopsis. So we, we are doing it, actually. So people have done. What you can easily do is common garden experiments. So we are doing this, other people have done it. You grow the same plants for a single generation in the same environment or in different environments, right? And you see, you know, you measure seed sets or something like that, right? So that's been done. Uh, experimental evolution, the problem is you're dealing with an annual plant here, right? So it takes many years. So yeah, that's one thing. And uh, hmm? Yeah, but not then in the natural environment. So then you have to do it in the lab, and then I don't know how meaningful it is, right? Out in nature, uh, with these natural. But yes, we have actually done this. This is one of the, this is our crazy experiment that we started several years ago. So we did one of these between northern and southern Sweden, right? We took lines and we did a reciprocal transplant. We grew them in common garden and, and so on, just like everyone did. But then we said, why don't we also do an insane experiment? See if we can compete them, right? So we mixed all the seeds, right? Bags, and we just like, sawed big patches. Um, right? So, and then have followed this now for several years, doing what ecologists do. We lay down grids uh, several times per year, you know, go out with a, you know, randomize, go and pick plants with tweezers, stick them in test tubes, freeze them. And um, we have data for like three years, 10,000 little plants in the, in the freezer. The problem now is that we first have to genotype all these, right, to figure out who actually won, right? So, um, I don't think they. I don't think they compete very much with each other. I don't think that them. Well, what, what we expect? So why are we doing that? I mean, the main reason we want to do it is because when you do a common garden experiment, you only get part of the life cycle, right? I think the main, the most important thing is actually kind of what Ophelia Lee was talking about is the dispersal of seeds and the establishment of new seedlings, right? Not, they have an enormous and. So you have to have many generations, and the problem with this, right, is that uh, there are incredibly strong maternal effects. On, so seed dormancy is a horribly labile trait, right? That, and there is clearly maternal, you know, the mother plant influences when the seeds will germinate, right? So unless, if you take, you know, so it's actually, so for the, any experiments we did, we actually made sure that we produced the seeds under field conditions first, so that they have the right programming to, to germinate at the right time. Because you see this all the time, right? If you, get, if you germinate at the wrong time, you are just dead, right? Because it's so important to get, to get established. So that's why we need to, to do this. So we've done this, right? But then, yeah, so, but this is what we, uh, I was telling, um, so it's taken a long, to do, a long time to do this, but we finally figured out, right? So, but to, to really do this experiment, then you have to figure out a way so that you can identify genotype. You know, you're talking about little plants that are like, you know, the size of a fingernail, right? How can you genotype those things? Uh, and so we know how to do this. Now we're sequencing them completely, right? And we've gotten the price down to six, six euros per plant 
to do this. And we are, you know, I think we've sequenced the first 1,500 or so to basically see, and it looks like it's actually working. We see selection, right? The northern ones did better in the, south, in the north, and the southern ones did better in the south. But we haven't analyzed this yet. The idea was that you can actually do GWAS for fitness directly. On this thing, so that's obviously what we're going to look at. That was a long lead up to that. Uh, so hopefully, if we can see any correlation with, between these alleles, if you can see any correlation with, uh, you know, methylation on, on, a, on a global scale, and so on. Yes, we, we're definitely going to look at that. But we're going to need to do a lot more field experiments. The plan here is that if you can actually, now we have these specific alleles, right? You can make crosses and plant those out and then, you know, uh, see what happens. Uh, but yeah, we do see broad scale adaptations between north and south. We see other weird things like in the common garden, we have, uh, you know, flowering time matters to some extent. We find uh, <laughs> in one of our experiments, slugs came in and ate half the population, and there's a massive GWAS hit on glucosinolate production. So we, you know, genes that are involved in resistance to slugs and things like this. Uh, so it, uh, this is, this is uh, yeah, really, really cool. But Well, so that, that's kind of what we're going to have to... You need field trials to do this, right? The, I mean, the problem is that measuring fitness here is not at all easy, right? I mean, the only way... I mean, you can't... I mean, the minimum requirement is planting them out in nature and measuring something like seed set, right? Uh, that gives you some idea, but it's still not the best experiment. The best experiment is to actually grow them over multiple generations, and, uh, which, which we're doing. Yeah, so that's, that's essentially what we're going to do, right? We're going to take these, well, I think what we're going to do is uh, make um, crosses between different genotypes you know, that are sort of extreme here, right? And, and see what happens. But then, but also, yeah, but also sort of monitor them what happens, like is there actually mobilization of transposable elements and, and so on and so forth. Something I didn't say here, we also have started... Um, looking at, um, there's also huge variation in, in the load of transposable elements that appears to be some of these lines have twice as many transposable elements as the others. Why, I don't know, and, uh, yeah, but it's interesting. This is something very different, right?